good morning and uh, good afternoon to all the present participants and uh, it is my pleasure to invite you all to this uh, to this webinar which has been organized by the irpid iran node on empowerment and capacity development of women in water resources management it's a very important webinar we were just discussing prior to the commencement that the role of women in the water resources management is very important for the upliftment of the society and deriving the optimum output from the resources that are made uh, available uh, the we we have the presence of uh, professor dr ragab ragab uh, uh, from the uh, president of uh, icid and then our moderator is dr mohammad waba our vice president honorary of icid and the chair of the cdte so uh, before going further i would uh, now request uh, dr waba to to take up the introduction of uh, of of the learned uh, speakers we have a very eminent uh, faculty here with uh, headed by uh, ms uh, honorable carlin mewad and 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 nargis sarabi and anti broma so i will re now request uh, uh, dr waba to take up the introductions Uh, thank you very much, uh, Secretary General, uh, Engineer Pandya. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening, everybody, wherever you are. Uh, this is uh, Muhammad Wahaba. It's uh, a pleasure and uh, honor to be the moderator of this important webinar on empowerment and capacity development of women in water resources management. Uh, you are very welcome welcome in, in this special webinar which is organized by the international research program uh, for irrigation and the drainage feed uh, iranian node and the uh, capacity uh, development training and education working group of the international commission on irrigation and the drainage and uh, the webinar is hosted technically by the icid main office in delhi uh, we do uh, believe that empowering uh, women in, in water management provides a necessary foundation for effective water management and achieving sustainable development goals. Uh, expanding women's uh, role helps achieve sustainable development and provides more resilience for water resources systems against vulnerable communities facing drought or water scarcity caused by climate change. Uh, optimizing uh, the water management sector through women's empowerment and capacity development can impact the research in climate adaptation, health uh, studies, uh, poverty alleviation, uh, capacity building for communities and women's roles. Uh, this webinar aims to discuss about improving women's participation in water uh, management. In this regard, strengthening uh, the participation of women through capacity building and empowering them in water management, both at the major and the micro scales, is the primary goal of this webinar. And therefore, uh, the main objective of this webinar can, can be uh, categorized as follow to improve the gender equity, uh, equity in water management enhance women's participation in water resources decision and uh, policies, uh, participation of women in the water user association involving women in water project. What have we learned from experience? Uh, empowering women to improve their water related skills, knowledge and livelihoods. Last but not least to determine what uh, practical steps need to be taken to empower women in water resources management. Uh, the program of the webinar uh, will have uh, uh, about five minutes opening remark by the president, Dr. Ragab, then we'll have uh, uh, 
the three uh, distinguished speakers will have between 15 to uh, 20 minutes for each uh, speaker. And then we'll have 30 minutes for uh, you and, uh, and uh, question and answer. And then we'll have the closing remark by the President Dr. Raga. Uh, you are kindly requested to turn off your microphone and before the closing remark, you will be asked kindly to turn on your camera, camera for group photo. You can also send your questions to the distinguished speakers in Q and A chat. And please mention, you can mention for whom uh, uh, is the question to, uh, or it is just a general question. Uh, before to move to the honorable speakers, <coughs> allow me to invite uh, ICID uh, President Dr. Raga Ragab to give his uh, opening remark. Uh, Dr. Ragab, the floor is yours, okay. please. Yeah. All right. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Waba, and uh, thank you to the Central Office for organizing the webinar. Um, in my introduction, I have a few slides uh, to share with you uh, to set the scene for today's webinar. Uh, let me share uh, my screen. I hope it's a full screen now. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, now it is okay. Is that okay now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to thank our speakers first, uh, the Honorable Lady Dr. Carleen uh, Maywald and uh, Dr. Nargis uh, Zahrabi and Dr. Ansi uh, Broma for uh, volunteering to give these uh, uh, presentations today to the uh, participants in the webinar. Uh, before really I go further is that I would like to say that the gender equality is a millennium uh, development uh, goal uh, uh, in its own right. And it is directly related to achievement of the, the other uh, millennium goals uh, like uh, zero hunger and uh, poverty. Uh, the role of uh, women in agriculture and society that actually uh, uh, is, is uh, listed in so many documents as globally about 42% of women workers are engaged in agriculture and in developing countries, the agriculture supports about 53 almost percent of women workers. In South Asia and India, over 60% of women workers are in agriculture. Women always have valuable local ecological and social knowledge derived from their traditional gender roles. In African countries, as in the most developing countries, women are in principle managers of natural resources, which they and their families rely on for their livelihoods. Women bear the, the brunt of domestic tasks, processing food crops, providing water and firewood, and caring for the elderly and the sick. And the reasons for the inequality actually is that women are largely underrepresented, in many cases excluded from environmental decision making processes, especially in the context of climate change adaptation. Pre existing gender roles hinder women's ab abilities to participate in water policy development, even at the most basic levels. In many policies, women are, for, uh, are offered very limited rights to water and use of river systems, thus reducing access to irrigation, business needs, uh, or domestic use. Women's rights are limited by existing gender biases in development and management of water distribution. Women have had limited participation in community efforts to distribute and manage water uh, equitably. Women have less access to resources, land, credit, agricultural input, research and innovation, training and uh, rural extension services, and to a varied sources of income, which of course yeah, affects their abilities and uh, their participation as 
uh, actively as water managers. Ways to improve the gender in uh, equ uh, to improve the gender equality. Agricultural policy makers and development practitioners have an obligation to ensure that women are able to participate fully in and benefit from the process of agricultural development. At the same time, promoting gender equality in agriculture can help reduce extreme poverty and hunger. Equality of, for women would be good for agricultural development. Building inclusive governance structure and strengthening the role of civil society, especially women in water governance, are essential components for addressing vulnerability and fostering resilience and sustainability in rural centers as well as in rural areas. Improvement towards more balanced control over water and irrigation would imply not only changes and uh, changes in related policies and laws, but also in water culture. Low income rural and urban women who are the ones literally carrying the burden of collecting and managing water must be more visible at all level of decision making. Women are vulnerable to climate change and many women in developing countries travel great distance to find water. So climate change will make their daily lives even more difficult. Because of their social roles and position worldwide, women are greatly affected by water scarcity and the flooding, yet they face great difficulties in participating effectively in governing bodies. Socially vulnerable people and women in particular are the least equipped to deal with climate change impacts due to their disadvantaged economic and political position. Reducing the women really uh, inequalities and vulnerability, education and improvement, involvement of women in formal decision-making processes can strengthen their adaptive capacity. Building women adaptive capacity in particular, besides assisting individual women to become politically active and develop their leadership can contribute to enhancing their roles in water management and food production. Community-based environmental education is therefore required in order to expand the uh, equitable involvement of women in water-related climate change position activities and agricultural development. Uh, quantification of the inequality. There are actually a number of uh, indices. Women emp uh, empowerment has been measured using multiple indicators. An example of multi-dimensional indicator is the Global Gender Gap Index uh, developed by the World Economic Forum. It measures achievements in four broad outcomes, health, education, economic participation, and political empowerment. And, and also another one, the Women Empowerment in Agricultural Index, WEAI, was introduced in 2012 as multidimensional measure to assess women access to resources and the ability to make decision in five domains of agriculture, production, resources, control over income, leadership, and time use. In response, also the International Food Policy Research Institute has modified that uh, the last uh, indicator by reducing the number of sub-indicators and introduced two more indicators to become seven. And they have, they have been making those analysis using those indicators. I want to go through all the details, but they have been actually also comparing different regions within the same countries. This is an example from India, where you can see how different regions, they, they differ in the empowerment level uh, uh, in agriculture and water management. And they found from the study, the main drivers for, of women's this uh, empowerment are the presence of membership in agriculture related self-help groups, uh, ownership of land and the control uh, over uh, income. So there are some ways to quantify and to improve, and also to look at one region compared to the other and to see why one region is doing better than the other and, and to see how we can improve by learning from uh, other regions that we will have more empowerment than the others. Uh, here there are some references for you to, to have uh, uh, to look at uh, if, you wish, if you wish to. And, and also uh, this is uh, here, for the ICRD uh, forthcoming events, 
of course, you are most welcome to come, and I welcome you uh, to visage uh, our Congress uh, meeting in first week of November this year. Also, we have other a number of workshops during this year during visage meeting. One of them is the Water Food Energy Nexus. We have also another workshop on climate change and another one on agricultural water management. And we have the uh, the drainage workshop in uh, Tajikistan and uh, in next year uh, May 2024. And of course, we have the Middle East, and then we have Sydney, and we have Kuala Lumpur, and we have. Uh, also another international IEC and Congress in France in 2026. So this is a list of events. I would like really to welcome you all to this um, event. And and I, I thank you very much for your attention. And I wish you a very pleasant and fruitful uh, discussion after our uh, eminent speakers. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Ragab, uh, please, can you stop sharing? Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Dr. Ragab. Uh, and uh, now allow me to introduce the uh, honorable speakers. And uh, I would like to, to start with uh, Dr. Honorable uh, Carlin uh, Maywald. Uh, Dr. Carlin uh, is currently, uh, currently the South Australian Water Ambassador. Her previous roles include South Australian Minister for Water Security and the River Murray Chair, Chair of the Australian National Water Commission and the Murray Darling Basin Ministerial Council member. Uh, Dr. Marlin is uh, currently uh, Managing Director of uh, My World Consultant and holds a portfolio of uh, board uh, position including Chair of uh, Water Aid Australia, a Chair of the uh, Peter uh, Cullen Environment and the Water Trust, and she is a Director of Water Aid International and Australian Water Association. Uh, during her uh, political career, uh, Carlin was the first woman elected to the seat of uh, uh, Shafi in, in the House of, uh, of Assembly. Uh, the first woman to be leader uh, of a national uh, party in Australia, and the first woman to have a baby as an elected member in the South Australian uh, Parliament. Uh, Dr. Carlin uh, will give uh, answer to some important questions as how do we ensure uh, we are fixing uh, the system rather than taking an approach that is fixing women. And how do we ensure that uh, when thinking about empowering women, we are being inclusive of all women, women with uh, disabilities, women of diverse education experience, women of color. And what are three things that have been key to your experience as a woman leading in water resources management. Uh, what, what role should men play in enabling women's empowerment? Uh, your Excellency, uh, Dr. Carling, uh, the floor is yours, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Waba, and thank you for, to Professor Ragab for your introductory remarks, which set the scene very well for this webinar today. And I'd also like to acknowledge my esteemed panelist colleagues, Dr. Anthi and Dr. Nargez. It's a, it's a wonderful to be able to share um, the, the platform with you both. Women in water and women in water decision-making is a complex and very difficult agenda to work our way through. And depending on what country you're in, you are in and what you are trying to achieve, it will mean many different things. Firstly, I'll ask the question or answer the question is why should women be involved? And the answer to that is really simple. When you have such complex issues, such as 
water, which has multi, multiple stakeholders, multiple disciplines and which need to be embraced to, to come up with solutions. There are multiple government agencies involved. There are multiple levels of local politics, community politics, national politics. And it just seems senseless to leave 50% of the population out of these discussions. The other thing that I think is really important when discussing why women should be involved in this is that the complexity of progressing water reform and a water reform policy agenda requires negotiation. And women are natural negotiators. That's what they do in their family. That's what they do in their communities. And they work towards solutions in a very different way to men. And when you bring men and women around the table and use the skill set of both genders, you are likely to get a more lasting and a more efficient result in your decision making. When engaging in, in improving access to decision making for women, there's a number of different levels that need to be considered. The first one I'll talk about is women's participation in decision making at the community level. At the community level, you are dealing with many multiple different elements that must be considered that are not water elements before you can embrace changing the way in which women can be involved. And most of those around local culture. Local culture is one of the issues that is the greatest inhibitor for women's participation. And one of the biggest faults that most people who want to embrace change at the local level, particularly in developing countries make, is they go in and seek to have women involved without addressing the fact that the culture doesn't enable that to occur. So having conversations with the local culture and the local leaders in those communities to create the environment where women leaders can be embraced is a first step before you even can start talking about water reform or embracing women and empowering women in this space. So at the local level, it is critically important that you understand the dynamic in which you are operating and the dynamic in which you are trying to implement change. It's also senseless to bring men in to talk to men and women in that environment. You need to be bringing women who are experts in this area and understanding to help create the environment to bring women leaders forward in the community. And then it is critically important to create those leaders in the community, to create for those leaders in the community the, opp the opportunity to develop their capacity as leaders. This is an education exercise, not a water exercise again. So when we get to the stage where we have leaders in our community who are men and women, and we have education in regards to your role and your responsibilities as a leader in those communities, you can then have the conversation about how those people, both men and women, can be engaged more equally in the conversations about decision-making around water. The second point I'd like to make is women's uh, participation at the enterprise level. So we're, we're talking about here having an equal access to opportunities for jobs, not just in the enterprises that are actually building dams or constructing um, equipment, but those people who are making decisions at the local level. So how do you create the environment for the decision making at local levels to become more equitable? And those self-help groups, for example, how do you create the environment for women to participate in those self-help groups when the culture currently doesn't allow them to do so? So the environment you need to create is one of inclusivity that creates a need for change within that society, and within that community that shifts the culture. First, before you can enable those conversations to occur, how women can participate. So when you're talking about enterprise level, I mean at local government level, I mean on your natural resource management boards or your community groups that are advising government in regards to problems that may be uh, at a local level, 
but it also means that the women who are working in enterprises that are coming to those communities with solutions. So if you have an organization that is a consultancy firm, for example, that's scoping what the problem is in an enterprise, are there women and men involved in that enterprise too? Are there men and women that are equally effectively making decisions in that enterprise to help inform what the solution might be that is developed in that local community? And then that all goes all the way up. The government agencies that you're currently working in, how many of you have an equal number of men and women or even close to a small percentage of women working in the engineering departments in your agencies? We need to actually start to address that as well because until we can see that at the government level and at the enterprise level, women are being embraced and it's very hard to change the culture in the communities that need to embrace women's empowerment also. Then there's also at the higher level leadership. How do you actually get more women engaged in the political processes that lead to sound decision-making? My personal experience is that when you have men and women around the table together, the conversations shift and change. And you need more than one woman. If you have one woman around the table, her voice is rarely heard. You need to have a number of women that can bounce off each other and create an enabling environment for women to feel empowered to have conversations that they would not be able to have if they're a lone voice in a, men, a room full of men. We also need to consider that in the water space, it's not always going to be an engineering solution. And it might be an engineering solution at the end of the process, but at the start of the process, it's behavioral change that needs to occur first. And embracing women in the conversation around behavioral change makes sense. They are much better and have greater empathy with communities and their fellow citizens that enable conversations to be different than those that would occur if you just have a room full of engineers. And to create the environment to have sustainable solutions in the water sector, embracing the empowerment of women and enabling those voices to be heard can lead to very different decisions. It can lead to different decisions around defining what the problem is in the first instance. We can all quote many, many different examples around the world where well-intentioned investment has occurred in developing countries to support sanitation and water supply that are now white elephants and not used by those communities. The reason why is those communities were not embraced and in particular the women who have the responsibility in those communities were not embraced in, in co-defining what the problem is in the first instance. Often we decide what someone's problem is and then we go about designing a solution for them without actively engaging with them. So the first step is to understand the community and work with the community to determine exactly what the problem is. And if you embrace women in those conversations, you often and most often get a different answer as to what the real problem is. And you may also get a different answer as to what the solution might be. And quite often that solution can be more efficient than just the first view, first observed engineering solution. The other thing that I think is really important in, in women's empowerment is building trust in the communities and the societies in which you're working for women to feel confident in standing up and having their voices heard. And we do not invest enough, anywhere near enough time in this. Often when we're looking at problems around water in a particular community or a complete particular region, the community engagement aspect of it is often the box you tick at the end of the process, not at the start of the process. And if you engage with community and include women in that process up front, you will build trust with those communities. You build trust with those communities. You will then build trust in a process that engages women and that then will provide the opportunity for you to develop and enable education programs, leadership development programs that will then lead to 
leaderful communities that will have a greater role in determining the future and the sustainable solutions that they need for their communities. It'll also enable you to clearly define the roles and functions of different people in those communities, which can include women and a subtle cultural change that will enable women to participate in those conversations. And it, the outcomes can be very, very different when you take that approach to it rather than just, um, I guess, approaching a community on the basis that we must include women, uh, tick the box, here they are over there, we've had a meeting and that's it, we've done our job. That will not be a lasting solution. It needs to be built into the process up front and it needs to be a multifaceted approach in, in creating the opportunity for cultural shift with the, um, the cultural norms in that society, with um, the opportunity for education and development of, of leaders within those communities. And then the, the example that is set by you as an agency that's going into that community that you're embracing women as well. I think we need to be able to define clearly for our communities what our expectations are and actually embrace that cultural change is just as important as the resultant water reform that you might get if you want lasting results and better decisions to be made. In my own personal example, um, I have broken through many, many barriers as a woman. And I've done that through being able to clearly understand what it is that I want to achieve, to clearly understand who I need to influence to achieve that, to clearly understand who's driving the people I need to influence now, and then having the capacity to understand how I can have impact in that space. Now you don't do that just by ticking a box at the end of a process. It's a continuous learning process and a continuous enabling process. And one of the key factors in my success is that men have stepped up to support me and men have stepped aside to enable me to do things and to be in that space. I could not have been elected into the seat of Chafee in the House of Assembly if the old norms of a man being elected to the, the parliament was the culture that was still embedded in our community. And the reason why that culture shifted was men enabled that to occur. Men stepped aside and enabled me the opportunity to be pre-selected to run in that seat and win that seat. So men have a really big role to play in this and they need to be a partnership with women. We need to be working together to actually create the environment that not only empowers women, enables women, but the environment that steps aside, that allows women to move into those positions. Otherwise, we will be doing the same thing over and over and over again that we're doing for the last 20, 30, 40 years for the next 20, 30, 40 years. So I encourage all of the men in the webinar that are here with us today, all the leaders that are men, to embrace the up and coming stars, the women that you see that have potential, the women that you would like to see have a potential and nurture and enable the career paths for those women to be able to be part of the decision making. That's the critically important step that I think men need to play in the role of enabling women's empowerment in water and decision making in water based decision making. Uh, I think I'll leave it there, Dr. Wabba. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Carlin. Uh, I think uh, you mentioned important uh, point we have to consider and at the end uh, for us as I mean we are uh, very glad and uh, and uh, will do our best to support uh, the role of uh, women in water resources and how we could give them the opportunity to be a leader and, and uh, as a decision maker. At the same time, uh, I would like to take uh, this opportunity to, uh, to mention that uh, we already established our African Young Professional Forum and International Young Professional Forum. And the majority of the members, they are women. And uh, which means that uh, in, in the near future, we'll have many leaders in, in many countries. And uh, 
uh, with all our support, will be working with them. Uh, I, I would like to thank you uh, again, uh, and then we could uh, move to uh, to the second uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Anti Roma. Uh, Dr. Roma uh, was more than 22 years of professional and academic experience. Uh, Anti has worked on water uh, governance, uh, policy and financing and the natural resources management at national, regional, and sub-regional and transboundary levels in the Mediterranean within many international organizations like uh, UFM, EU, UN, UNEB, uh, by MAP, uh, UNECE, uh, ESCOA, UNDB, uh, and uh, also uh, OECD uh, frameworks. Uh, she had uh, led and managed and service more than 13 regional projects funded by multilateral uh, EU, UN, uh, GEF, uh, uh, African, Devel African Development Bank. And since 2019, she is leading the agenda on diversity, gender, uh, and youth with Global Water Partnership Mediterranean. Uh, anti, uh, uh, a political scientist by education, uh, specialized through her uh, postgraduate and uh, uh, doctorate uh, studies on global development issue and water uh, policy, uh, prior to joining Global Water Partnership Mediterranean in uh, 2006. Anti worked uh, for three years as a lecturer at uh, SOAS. Uh, University of London, and two years as a, a freelancer, water expert in Madrid, Spain. Dr. Anti, uh, in your presentation, uh, can you, you share with us how your organization is supporting efforts towards gender equality? And, and uh, can you share also more information on your work on empowering uh, uh, female uh, leadership in water sectors. Uh, Dr. Anti, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohammed, and uh, a very, uh, very warm thanks to the organizers, primarily the International Research Program for Irrigation and Drainage Data on the Regional Node, and of course the co organizers, the Iranian National Committee on Irrigation and Drainage, and ICID's Working Group on Capacity Development training and education. Um, I'm really pleased and uh, very honored uh, to join you and share some reflections uh, together with Honorary Karlin Maywald and uh, Dr. Najis and Sohrabi. And we are very happy that uh, Dr. Mohammed Shahada Wahba, you're moderating the session. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. Um, allow me to share my screen. Sorry, just give me one second to be able to share the screen. Um, please tell me if you can if you can see this. Yes, yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Uh, allow me to keep it on this mode because uh, yeah, there are a few issues <laughs> with the computer. I hope you can see it well. Uh, well, uh, I think there is no how to say there is no need to, to to stress the importance of gender and uh, why we should be uh, you know focusing on that. Um, Dr. Agab's intro provided a, a great overview, and Honorary Karlin may would uh, you know stress the role of, of leadership, especially at the community level. Um, what I would like to say uh, and stress at the beginning is that when talking about um, gender mainstreaming. It's not a, it's, it's going well beyond the integration of women or their representation in the different bodies. But we're talking about fully integrating all gender perspectives. And in fact, moving towards gender equality uh, and not staying with uh, gender mainstreaming, uh, utilizing ideally a gender transformation, a gender transformative approach, as we, as we say. Uh, 
uh, as you said, Dr. Mohammed, I will do two things. The one is not to share so much information about the Global Water Partnership, but to share with you uh, tools and, uh, and material that can be of use in your, in your work that uh, you know, we have produced uh, when it comes to, to gender and uh, you know, assisting the efforts towards gender equality. And then I will share with you the work that we have done and the key findings from an initiative on uh, strengthening female leadership in the water sector in the MENA region uh, when it comes to water diplomacy. So just a couple of words for those that do not know, um, do not know us. The Global Water Partnership is a global multi-stakeholder action network with a vision for the water secure world. Uh, we are extending uh, throughout the globe with uh, 13 regional partnerships covering most, you know, almost all the parts of, uh, you know, of, the, of the globe and uh, working together with more than 3000 partners in 179 countries. Uh, the partners are not individuals. These are institutions, organizations, different bodies. Um, we have, were established back in 1996, and since uh, 2000, we have an intergovernmental status uh, hosted by the government of Sweden. Um, well, uh, two words so you can see where the gender um, agenda comes in. Uh, we're implementing currently our five-year strategy through this um, uh, cross-feeding uh, tactic of we mobilize, we act, we learn. And the point is to be able to support system change. There are three anchor areas that you can see here on the right-hand side, water solutions for the sustainable development goals, climate resilience through water and transboundary water cooperation. But importantly, there are also three anchor cross-cutting anchor areas, one of which is about working towards gender equality. And this is where we're gonna focus on. There is a lot of work that has been done. I would like to, to raise your attention on a couple of items that uh, could be of interest and of value to you. In addition to a gender strategy, that uh, is a very concise way uh, explaining the approach that we have as an organization towards gender equality, we have also produced an action piece on gender equality and inclusion in water resources management that includes uh, and has identified and has worked on four tangible action areas along with their recommendations. And it's quite interesting to see how this, this works uh, in the area of work that we do. Plus there has been um, a, a dedicated publication coming uh, from the formal reporting of the countries on SDG 651. This is a target on uh, the status of integrated water resources management. So a report was produced uh, comparing the responses, the formal responses of the countries when it comes to the gender targets. So the SDG report, um, unsurprisingly, has, um, has uh, basically confirmed that we're definitely not there yet when it comes to the Agenda 2030. Um, and uh, the priority of the countries to, to on gender remains alarmingly low. Importantly, it has also identified seven enablers for gender mainstreaming in water resources management that are very practical and can be easily um, uh, used and implemented. Uh, I, I, I do include in the different slides um, resources, so web links, and I'm, I'm happy to share them also afterwards. So you can find all the material available over, over there. I would like also to raise your uh, attention and, uh, and encourage you to, to visit and use the material that we have uh, in the toolbox. This is an IWRM action hub that includes uh, you know, material and uh, communities of practice on different themes, uh, exchanging, interacting, sharing and learning. Um, and also on the vast um, resources that CAPNET has, this is uh, the material on the right hand side. CAPNET is a global network for capacity development in sustainable water management. Um, and over there, as you can see, there was a, a dedicated also uh, course on gender and integrated water resources management that in fact was uh, launched uh, twice uh, due to, uh, to request. And based on the finding, on the, on the work of this, um, of this course, a community of practice came into being. And this covers gender and water resources management. I would like to encourage you to not only visit, but also become members of this community of practice. It's a space, a safe space, 
um, a trusted space where we can exchange, we can learn, we can uh, we can ask, and we can we can interact, and uh, of course uh, uh, expand also our network. Um, and let me not get into the details of GWP Med. Uh, just to mention that, uh, as you know, we are one of the regional partnerships. We cover both shores of the Mediterranean basin, uh, with the emphasis being on the non-EU member countries, so North Africa, Middle East, and Southeastern Europe. Uh, we do have more than 100 uh, organizations uh, as our members, and uh, 10 of the major networks in the region. We do have political anchorage uh, that provides uh, a lot of support in that respect. And of course, a, a, a range of issues that we cover with a lot of focus on gender. Uh, with that, let me conclude uh, on, the, on the first part when it comes to what the organization does. And as I said, I'm happy to share again, you know, the links and the material and assist and uh, clarify more as needed. There is a wealth of, um, of resources that is available at your disposal to use as you see fit. So let us uh, you know, cross fertilize what we do and learn from each other. The second part, uh, and I'm, I'll briefly uh, share what we have done in this initiative when it comes to empowering women in water diplomacy in the Middle East and North Africa region. This is a, a process that is, is institutionally led by the Global Water Partnership Mediterranean and the Geneva Water Hub there is a political anchorage within the Union for the Mediterranean. And for the technical work, we had the support of the Swedish CEDA, uh, the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation and the University of Geneva. So what is this all about? This was, um, it started actually as a personal initiative, uh, interestingly enough, across, um, so across six ladies from the region, um, that believe in the power of women as change agents. And uh, if I'm allowed to share, we were also somewhat frustrated by the underrepresentation of women in, uh, in leadership positions, in the lack of, um, in the lack of, of women in, in high level positions when it comes to water diplomacy in transboundary water cooperation settings. So we came together with the aim to, to and that was the initial start to do a, a technical work, a mapping work, uh, using a very specific solid methodology, um, surveying and using the input from 93 women from five Arab countries, and, and be able to understand, um, you know, what are the current, what is the current status, and what are the current challenges facing women in water diplomacy and transboundary water cooperation in the MENA region. Um, the, the comparative study that was produced is uh, very interesting, and I will share with you uh, some of the key findings. Um, uh, interestingly enough, uh, through outreach and visibility, uh, this, this process that started as a technical work, a mapping work, it has evolved into an initiative um, that includes also a, a network of female water professionals across the MENA region, uh, and it has uh, also um, taken the form of a very targeted capacitation program based on uh, the innovative the experiential learning approach uh, with uh, you know, the 90 minute series. Um, but it, it is, it is uh, interesting to see how technical work can actually fit into something larger than that and, and be able to support the development and uh, the, the inclusion, further inclusion of women in different positions. Um, well, the, the, the point where I was sharing the, the co-authors of the comparative study is just to share with you that we have high level and very prominent female figures in the five countries that we covered, uh, ranging from former ministers or minister of water, as in the case of Morocco, to a former secretary general in the ministry of water, as in the case of, um, of Jordan, or the head of a department um, in the uh, in the in the Nile water sector in the in Egypt, and um, also as a, a lead um, negotiator uh, in the case of the Palestinian negotiation support project when it comes to Palestine. The comparative study I don't want to go into the details. It has different sections. Uh, the material is available online. I'm very happy to share with you. Uh, what I wanted to share with you are four slides with the key findings. Over here, you can see a, a snapshot of a comparison of the latest, the 93 women that participated in the study. 
And as you can see here from the graph and also from the table, these are women that are that they have many years of experience in the sector, and they're also uh, highly qualified um, uh, holders of masters and PhD degrees. Um, and this is across the five countries. The five countries, by the way, um, in case it was not, uh, uh, well, it's, it's evident on the top side of the slide, uh, the five countries are Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Morocco, and Palestine. So, um, when it, what, what, what has the comparison revealed? Um, the persistence of discriminatory ancestral practices uh, that are further combined with a conservative sociocultural context. And these constitute the main barriers to the involvement of women in public life in the MENA region. And despite the efforts made at different levels, uh, women in the region, they continue to occupy a secondary social role, which makes their contribution to national economic growth weak including the fluctuating water industry that can benefit significantly from a well-balanced and diverse management uh, and leadership environment. Despite the reforms undertaken and the progress achieved towards the promotion of women's rights in the MENA region, the sociocultural variant remains influential and significantly affects the balance of power between men and women in the decision-making sphere. The unequal distribution of domestic and family tasks within the societies in, of the MENA region, they hinder the empowerment of women and influence their access to power. When it comes to the factors in you know, contributing to the workplace of the male-female relations, and these are the responses according to the female respondents, okay? Let me clarify that the six factors that were chosen were those traditionally identified in overall gender mainstreaming research including the male dominant society, the absence of a proper legal, legislative and policy framework. However, the other two factors that they were included, they, um, they were included in line with the working assumption that there are elements within the control of women water professionals that could be worked with in order to increase the pool of female expertise in water diplomacy and shift negative perceptions towards successful female decision makers. Uh, the choice of these factors, these six factors, was based on an understanding of the cultural barriers in the countries of, you know, of, the, of, of focus and the expertise and experience of those that led the mapping in the countries, so the, the co-authors effectively. As for the results, and although the issue of the male dominant society, as you can see, is the main factor in, you know, in at least three of the countries, the lack of policy and legal frameworks were also considered as important decisive factors in the promotion of men to, see, to senior positions. Interesting, as you will notice, are the variations, steep in some cases actually, across countries when it comes to the percentages concerning the male female quota, the lack of female expertise, and the female negative perceptions. How about the factors that influence the acceptance of decision-making position according to the female respondents? The factors that were chosen here are those usually cited in the literature or those commonly expressed among working women in the region. It is also important, however, for the purposes here of the analysis to clarify that a position could be a minister in one of the line ministries, for example, or the head of a water-related negotiating team, the head of a regional commission or river basin organization, director of a water utility, among others, just to understand what we're talking when uh, referring to decision-making positions. As for the findings, the comparative graph here indicates that there is a consensus among all responses from the five countries about the lack of opportunity for women in comparison to those made available to male colleagues. Opportunities for promotion and advancement are biased towards men. In addition, women lack the support from their peers in actively overcoming the challenges on, of the absence of opportunities. And what happens to the skills needed to be a, a better a lead in water diplomacy positions? Um, when we did the mapping exercise, uh, you know, what was included were the traditional skills needed um, you know, to meet the specialized forms of diplomacy of the 21st century. However, this is not, uh, not to be understood as a bias 
towards the importance of the emerging non-traditional skills. It is rather an attempt to tackle the common arguments against women as having the needed qualifications for being water diplomats. Therefore, the fields of international law, including water, negotiations, political science, diplomacy, and international relations were included here as potential skills needed to better lead in water diplomacy positions. From the figure, it, uh, it, what is highlighted from the respondents to the questionnaires in the five countries is the recognition of the need to develop their diplomatic and international skills, as well as to acquire a better knowledge of related legal instruments. This is understandable, given that the technical competence of the women of the sample group in each country is already established. However, this evidence, uh, if it, it is evident across the five countries with variations, the need and opportunity to improve the comprehensive set of skills of a water diplomat through a tailored capacity building and mentorship program. The additional acquiring of needed skills will increase the pool of female expertise, provide more opportunities, raise confidence, and have an impact, even if slow and gradual, on the perceptions of women leaders and decision makers, both to men and women. Lastly, um, well, we, we had the opportunity, uh, by the way, to test uh, you know, the, the response that we received from the survey in the five countries beyond the MENA region. So we tested it in three uh, global events. Um, and uh, interestingly, the results were, were quite uh, comparable with uh, you know, the emphasis on the male dominant society, on uh, the, the understanding and the perception that women are the ones that often enough put obstacles in their own development and uh, up, you know, and 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 and, and, um, and getting uh, higher positions in the in the leadership. So this is, um, yeah, this is this is this is a food for thought. I would I would say. Um, but when it comes to the skills that we discussed and uh, further to literature, uh, we received also some direct reflections and advice by hands-on diplomats and transboundary water cooperation experts. We work with a large number of uh, such professionals and we thank them enormously for their pro bono contribution. So uh, the skills and attributes of a good water diplomat, but a good diplomat overall, as if you like, um, have been uh, grouped into different categories, including some core skills and general background concerning specific academic skills and abilities, that enable diplomats to manage professional relationships uh, during negotiations. Another set of uh, skills concerns communication and personal development with uh, strong communication skills being one of the priorities of a good diplomat as it helps better understand the counterparts and building trust and respect. And also a, a dedicated group of skills that has to do with women specifically and concern those specific characteristics that women typically bring to the negotiation table and are valuable elements for consensus building. And um, Honorary Carleen actually mentioned uh, such, such skills. So when we're talking about female water diplomats or mediators, uh, what they bring to the negotiation table is mm -hmm. skills that can be valuable for consensus building. For example, women have the natural ability to build trust to combine analytical and constructive thinking. They have better listening and negotiation skills and show a greater understanding of sensitive issues. At the same time, additional skills that could benefit female water diplomats include the ability to go outside one's comfort zone, identify innovative ways to support changes in cultural settings and open up to digitization and advanced technological tools. Uh, a female water diplomat who is informed and puts forward an argument based on technical knowledge will make all stereotypes that men have about women disappear. And with that, I would like to, 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 to close, um, sharing that this work is ongoing. We aim to expand to more countries in the region, so get more input from more countries on, on what um, are the obstacles, what are the challenges that women face when accessing uh, high decision-making positions in water diplomacy and transboundary water cooperation settings. Um, and the, 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 the importance uh, is to, to be able to, to have um, knowledgeable, capacitated, and open, uh, uh, open uh, uh, pool of, of, uh, of female professionals that can actually respond to the needs 
uh, for negotiation and um, and and uh, and high and well in high level decision making positions. Um, let me stop here actually and stop sharing my screen. I hope that I have not uh, uh, completely taken up the, the time. Very happy to follow up with discussion. Thank you so much again. Thank you very much, Dr. Anti, for your comprehensive uh, presentation and also for the Greek initiative you mentioned from the Global Water Partnership. I think uh, we have a strong uh, uh, experience we can build on it. And uh, also, uh, as you mentioned, uh, for the initiative, you, you concentrated mainly for, for how we can support women to, to, to reach as a decision maker. But I wonder also for future, as it is mentioned, the majority of, uh, of, uh, of the women mainly uh, uh, working as for the smallholder farmers. And I appreciate if we could consider how we can uh, consider them as one of the important uh, pillar for empowering uh, empowerment of women in water resources management. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Anti, and uh, and also uh, uh, we are waiting to to have more questions. Uh, we'll have the opportunity uh, to 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 give answer uh, after uh, we hear from uh, the next speaker, uh, uh, which is Dr. Nargis. Uh, 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 Zuhairi. Uh, Dr. Nargis uh, has more than uh, 21 years of academic and professional experience in water resources engineering and capacity development in water resources management. She has uh, held several uh, uh, notable positions in Iran, including Director General of Research and Technology at the Islamic Azad University. Uh, also consultant to the uh, CEO of uh, KWPA in new water technology, head of uh, Kazakhstan water and water technology, uh, head of Kazakhstan water and power higher education and research complex at the University of Applied Science and Technology of Water and the Power Industry. Now, Dr. Nargis uh, is assistant professor in water science and engineering department at the AEU uh, Ahwaz uh, branch. As a, a committed expert in her field, Nargis is uh, dedicated to uh, developing capacity in various water industry sectors with a sustainable development perspective aim at serving uh, humanity at uh, regional, national, and the global levels. Dr. Nargis is an executive member of the uh, Iranian uh, National Committee and uh, uh, participated in the ICID working group. Further, she serves as the head of uh, Erbid uh, Iranian Node. Dr. Nargis, uh, please, uh, can you give us answer uh, for uh, some important question? How do you uh, perceive uh, the involvement of women in water management in Africa and Eastern Asia nation as compared to the MENA region? And also, what is your opinion on the role of women in water management in Iran? Uh, Dr. Nargis, the floor is yours, please. Thank you so much. Share Okay. That's your turn. You can share your presentation. Dr. Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, hi everyone, hope you are doing well. I just wanted to give a big shout out and thank you to Dr. Rajab and ICID Central Office. Also Dr. Neris and Dr. Wahba for being here today and supporting the webinar. 
I would like to begin to by uh, thanking two other keynote speakers, Ms. Honor Carlin Weibold and uh, Dr. Antti Bruno for accepting our invitation to speak at this webinar. I would also like to express, express my gratitude to the member countries of IRPIT, Iran Regional Node, and the members of CDTE and Water Food Energy Nexus members, uh, working groups, and other members of uh, ICID working groups. Additionally, I want to extend, extend uh, my thanks and appreciation to Mr. Restani, the head of Iran CID, for this collaboration in organizing this webinar. And uh, I'm grateful, grateful for the persons of all participations in this webinar. It means a lot to have you all in here. The subject of my presentation is water is the exterior of life and woman is the giver of life. Okay. Dear all, I want to, uh, to talk to you uh, today about the pressing issue of water scarcity, which has become a sensitive and vital problem worldwide. It's, it's so important and the slogan for the World Water Day 2023 20, has been determined as accelerating change for solving the water crisis. It doesn't matter who are you or where are you, what your gender is, wherever and whoever you are, access to water is your right. Clearly, we need to examine what capacities exist or can be developed to help overcome this crisis. This is where we need to focus our, our efforts and work together to find solution to these global challenges. The slogan for the World Water Day 2023 is an urgent call to action. It's time for us to come together and work toward a sustainable future where everyone can access clean water. Let's take this opportunity to accelerate change and solve the water crisis once and for all. In that, women's participation plays, plays a crucial role in dealing with water scarcity since water is the source of life and women are the givers of life. Women not only bear the primary responsibility to collecting water in many parts of the world, but also they also possess valuable knowledge in the field of water resources and play a key role in the water and sanitation management and the local and community level. This is the powerful statement from UNESCO. In fact, the women have been carrying the burden of water collection and management for centuries. And it's essential to recognize their significant role in, the, in this field. Women possess valuable knowledge of water resources necessary to effectively manage your water and sanitation at the local and community level. Their participation in decision-making is crucial to ensure sustainable development. And we need to acknowledge and support their contribution to the water sector. I want to discuss 
uh, critical aspect, as I like Carlin, I think, about sustainable development, water resource management. Why is it a crucial? And why is women participation, participation essential, essential in ensuring good water resource management? Women's participation in the water sector is critical for various reasons. All we, we are here, we know, including social, economical, and environmental factors. For instance, in many societies, women are reasonable for providing for their families' needs, making access to resource sources like drinking water, sanitation, and irrigation vital. Furthermore, given women's central role in environmental conservation and natural resource sustainability, their participation in decision making and water resource management will increase eff efficiency and promote sustainability. Therefore, it's imperative to recognize the importance of women participation in water resource management and acknowledge their critical role in ensuring access to safe and clean water by empowering women and ensuring their participation in water resource management, we can move to our sustainable, a sustainable future for all. If we examine the current status of women uh, participation in various parts of the world, there are two significant issues to consider. The first is individual women participation, which can usually occur in all societies and doesn't necessarily mean a high rate of involvement of women in that society, but rather depends on the inherent ability of each individual. The second is societies with platform and environment for women's capacity building and development. In this section, I would like to share with you some statistics on the participation of women in various sectors, including utility workers, engineering and management at the global level. For example, a report re re released by the World Bank, um, I think in 2019, showed to that 20% of utility work opportunities were given to women. Another report from World Bank in 2022 based on the income. Income of countries in different regions region of world of the world is available as seen in the chart. In low income countries, the women's participation rates is higher and the gender gap percentage is lower. This participation rate decreases in countries with average income. And as a result, gender gap increases. In developing countries, women's participation is high and the gender gap percentage is lower. It's not worthy that men's participation in three times higher than that of women in South Africa, the Middle East, and North Africa. In other words, women's capacity is less utilized. This issue in influence by various factors, including economic structure, educational opportunities, laws, and cultural traditions. As you see in the figure, the same region 
namely the Middle East, North Africa, are often expressing high level of water stress and even severe water crisis, according to the studies conducted in the same of countries in this region, homemaking women are exposed to water scarcity and the lack of access to water. And they spend hours a day collecting water for their families. They have fe fewer equal opportunities to intermanage our general decision making positions. In other women, in others, other country women already facing higher vulnerability to poverty than men will, will be less able to the absorb the ensuring incoming shock. According to the results of various national and regional studies, it's evident that in developing countries, women are activity, actively present as water manager, technical experts, and high ranking officers in organization related to the water sector. Also, according to the Joint Research Center of European Commission, women make up 24% of water management in Europe. This figure is still lower than the European Union, uh, Union goals, goal of having 40% of women in decision-making position by 2020. So it seems the European countries still needs to increase their participation in water management. Various studies conducted worldwide indicate that the reasons behind the success of countries which high levels of women participation, especially in management position, are due to several factors, including firstly, professional company and individual capability are the main criteria for sub superiority and gender issue are less visible in the work environment with more gender equality. Secondly, policies in government programs to promote women participation in water resource management include encouraging women to participate in water resource management training, empowering women to obtain managerial positions, supporting the, establish, the establishment of women's companies in water resource management and other policies. Thirdly, a high level of education and qualifications enable them to convert for managerial joint jobs in water resource and success in this area. However, in addition to the mentioned access factors, such as raising awareness of women, it's very important. Removing legal barrier, gender mainstreaming, increasing attention to women's idea and achieving collaborative interaction between men and women, as Colin say, can be critical fundamental factors in developing countries. For example, in countries such as, you know, in Bangladesh and Kenya, despite problems such as poverty, illiteracy, diseases, and political tension, they have increased women participation in water management. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, currently multi-projects have been defined in the field of women's capacity development in the water sector uh, with the participation of international organizations. I show some example of this project and Dr. Antti Aswell mentioned some of them in her presentation. As you may 
have uh, inferred most of these studies have been conducted in Central Asia and Africa. It seems the women make up less than 70 percent percent of women achieve in the water industry is so greater attention from national and international institutions should be paid to considering conditions for strengthening and developing women's capacity. To efficiency, efficiently address the water crisis, all capacities must be utilized. The statistics show that water management has improved in communities where capacity development and empowerment has occurred. In conclusion, we request all stakeholders and actors in the water sector who are present in this webinar, especially the member countries of International Research Program for Irrigation and Drainage, Iran Regional Node, most of whom are facing severe water crises in the MENA region to seriously consider and implement capacity development, capacity building, and strengthening of women in all dimension of utilize this life-giving capacity for water, which is the source of life, not only in their own countries, but also globally to help solve the water crisis. We also draw the global community attention to project defined by, for example, Global Water Partnership, World Bank, UNESCO, FAO, and so on. We request that just as numerous projects we have carried out in various parts of the world to develop women's capacity, especially capacity development project for women to be given top priority in the MENA, MENA region, especially considering the critical water situation in this region. And uh, I'm so happy that Auntie said that I think Global Water Partnership initiate the program program for uh, men, I think. And uh, uh, three days ago, I uh, informed that uh, one program started in, in the UNDP, I think, and called different agency and different country to come and help uh, for the, I think, uh, one capacity development project about, I think, water, food, energy nexus, and it's a good opportunity, I think, for to involve women in those, this project more and more. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anti. Uh, at least, can you stop sharing your presentation? Uh, thank you uh, for your comprehensive uh, presentation. You highlighted uh, the gap in, uh, in, in, in these important topics in, 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 in non-developed countries. And uh, I fully agree with you. Uh, there is still a huge effort needed to support and uh, we ha we have to consider capacity building capacity development training and education as important uh, tools for to to strengthen and and uh, empower women in these important topics and uh, i would like to take uh, this opportunity to uh, to give recommendation to uh, to the President Dr. Ragab and also to the main office of ICID 
to consider uh, to have a task force for women uh, empowerment in water resource management under the platform of CDTE working group. And also uh, it will be uh, after uh, we heard from our distinguished uh, uh, speakers, uh, uh, we have many, many uh, uh, outputs. We have, we, we have to build on it and we have to, 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 to have more actions for solution and, and to, to support women in this uh, uh, important uh, uh, actions. No doubt that uh, uh, women are capable to do a great job for achieving the SDGs and also to, to even to achieve the, the sustainability uh, at their own level from bottom uh, uh, to top level. Uh, I think, uh, Mr. Mado, uh, can you could help me with uh, if there is any questions uh, from the chat box here? Yeah, yeah. Dr. Baba, questions are already yeah. there. Dr. Baba, Dr. Nereji is there, and he will also like to speak. So we can give uh, request him to share his okay. view. Okay, uh, most welcome. Uh, Dr. Nairizi, you are most welcome. It is, you can unmute yourself. Yes, please, Dr. Nairizi. You can unmute yourself, Dr. Nairizi. Oh. Okay, can you hear me now? Is there... Yes, yes, uh, uh, we can hear you, yes. Okay, thank you. Hello to everybody, all colleagues. I would like to thank Dr. Raga for uh, yes. the president. Uh, also, I would like to thank Mr. Pandya and our colleagues back in the office for uh, organizing such important uh, webinar and uh, which have been nicely moderating by Dr. Baba. Uh, and uh, so it is a very important issue. Uh, I, would person, I would like personally to have this issue improved and expanded in at ICID. Uh, it is a long way to go, of course, but we are only at the beginning. But we will do our best. It is my experience, personal experience. I've been running a company consulting engineering firm for the last 35 years. I started the only with 5% women involved in engineering. Now we are at 27%. And only 5% last year we increased the participation of the ladies and the engineering decision making. There are eight ladies already at this room that are listening to your comments. And uh, so I'm using uh, the Nagas comments to give priority always to the ladies. And I want to uh, uh, employ somebody, the priority is with ladies. Because I believe it is my personal experience. The ladies are more reliable, more focused and dedicated to the job. Uh, at the moment, uh, we are 27% ladies in the company, but when we go to the research and study section, there are 50% are ladies, and they are doing a very excellent job. And I'm thanking uh, them and there are eight, people, eight ladies present here as their representative. And thank you, and that is also very, and all the uh, uh, speakers, Dr. Maywald, very nicely presenting, and Dr. Guma, and also our uh, colleague, Dr. Uh, Zora. And I wish to see you all again in next event soon. Thank you very much.
Thank you, uh, President Honorary Dr. Nairizi and uh, Dr. Sylvester, Vice President. Dr. Sylvester, please, you can mic, yes, you sir. can unmute, uh, unmute your microphone. Yes, please. Okay, thank, thank you, uh, um, uh, Program Director, and um, greetings, colleagues from um, South Africa. Um, my mine is it's a comment and a suggestion. Um, thank you very much for all the speakers. I mean, the, 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 they shared a very interesting, I mean, comprehensive presentation. Um, I fully agree with you, Program Director, that uh, we need to establish a task force because women issues are very, very important. From our perspective here in South Africa, we have got uh, cross-cutting programs that deal with women and youth. And therefore, um, we are also aligning uh, uh, these women and youth issues with our uh, national programs. And we have done a lot of work uh, on these issues. Um, we, we can share materials with you um, if you are interested so that, I mean, we strengthen these initiatives and we need to be at the forefront as um, ICID um, family. Uh, there are practical case studies that we have done in the Southern African region, and uh, we are ready to share uh, materials um, um, with colleagues because we also link uh, women issues with climate change um, um, challenges. And I'm glad that one of the presenters, or I mean, the opening remarks done by ICID president touched um, on such kind of issues. So thank you very much for really uh, sharing this thought. We really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vice President Dr. Sylvester. And uh, uh, Mr. Madhu here, can you help me for the question? Yeah, uh, all we have questions, one. Yes. Yeah, questions are available in the Q&A section. Can you see them? I think we have here, uh, I see one from uh, Sabina Khatari. Uh, 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 it is for uh, Honorable uh, Carleen. Uh, we had opportunity to meet you in person in Nepal during the its uh, ARC meeting. I am uh, serious, what, what was your observation in women empowerment leadership in uh, Nepal's irrigation. What water sectors? Uh, Dr. Carlin? Thank you so much for the yes, questions, Dina. Yes. And I um, in very much enjoyed my trip um, to Nepal in 2018. Um, the observations that I had at the time were that there was um, a commencing emphasis on, on thinking about um, how women should be more uh, involved in decision making and how women could enhance decision making in Nepal, very similar to other places around the world. But the question of how was really challenging, just as it is arrest around the rest of the world. And what I would like to actually just say right now is um, to commend um, Dr. Narisi on his comments and the efforts that he is applying within his business and the fact that his actions are speaking as loud, if not louder than his words and being the ambassador that he is for championing the cause for women with his own, his own business creates more emphasis and more momentum around women in water when you have champions and leaders in industry who are men who are doing that. And I think the same is needed in Nepal as it is in most developing countries. Women are the backbone in a lot of the water sector in Nepal and in the irrigation sector. However, they are still somewhat excluded from decision-making. And I think there's still a lot of work to be done from my perspective, from what I saw back in 2018. That's now five years ago. And um, I'd be interested to hear from you, Sabina, um, how you see how it is progressing in Nepal since those times. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Carlin. And also there's another question to Dr. Nargis uh, regarding uh, uh, the accelerating change to, uh, for the solving on water crisis in the MENA region. 
is there any initiative for sub-Saharan African or any leadership program for those who are uh, aspiring leaders? I think uh, this question, it could be for Dr. Nargis and also for Dr. Anti. Dr. Nargis? If you, is there any initiative for Sub-Sahara African or any leadership program? Mm -hmm. Do you know, I think in Afri uh, African uh, society, there has been a gender emphasis on educating and empowering women. In this regard, numerous international organization and program, including United Nations, the EMI, for example, IWA are active in various regions of the world to educate and empower women in water resource management. Uh, and additionally, many African countries, women are forced to work in sector related to water resource management, such as agriculture and livestock, I think, uh, due to economic and uh, uh, social condition, I think. Um, this has led to women becoming familiar with issues related to water in these countries and as a result becoming more active in the you know, water resource management. Therefore, uh, I think uh, uh, emphasize on uh, educational, academic, and uh, increase uh, to use of the, now, uh, increase the knowledge to use of technology is good for African, I think, because uh, something is started at base level in this country, I think. Uh, but in some parts of, for example, MENA cap uh, capacity building and development through educating the proper water use concepts while considering cultural aspects will help to, um, I think, to integrate women into society. For instance, um, I think uh, given the current water management situation in some parts of um, for example, Afghanistan, there is potential for women to become actively involved. Still, it must be strengthened to ensure the inclusion in overall management. Uh, and uh, I think uh, in uh, African country, the capacity development project is started and continue and need in different level. But emphasize on, I think, uh, um, grassroots level and they should introduce modern science. I think modern science and technology is, is better, I think, I don't know. Yeah. But uh, I, I said in MENA, capacity development, capacity, uh, building is very important and some area empowerment of them is important. The empowerment is related to the government in that country and accept the international support. Do you know? In African country, I think the government accept the international support and start some ac action in base level and they have some seat in managing level but not decision making not decision making but in the manner in some country you don't we uh, we omitted the woman you know we omitted the woman in some part of the mena country and started the capacity development, the capacity building project, very, very, very important because water is alive and women given the life. But in some country, empowerment of women and change the law maybe or help the woman 
and help the woman, encourage them, and accept their capability. Our problem is not gender. Okay, I think uh, in some countries we don't have problem for gender. Just, just uh, as I, as Colin said, we need to sit together, men and women, and talk together to solve the water problem. Not for that country, but for the critical situation of water in the wall of the world. Well, I guess, thank you very much, uh, uh, because we have limited in time. Uh, Dr. Colin, uh, would you like to add something after after uh, uh, to hear from uh, Dr. Anti? Because there are some initiatives in the MENA region from uh, Global Water Partnership. Dr. Anti, please. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohammed. Um, very briefly, uh, also in response to Professor Sylvester's uh, you know, question and also the question about what's happening in the African continent, I would like to raise uh, you know, the attention on, uh, I'm going to put it also on the chat, on the African Water Investment Program, which is a very ambitious continental effort uh, to transform the investment outlook for water security and sustainable sanitation across the continent, across Africa. And within that, there is a dedicated program uh, bringing together gender, water, and climate. The objective is to transform gender inequalities at scale and be able to influence climate resilient water investments. So there is a lot of work that is being done. Uh, on, this, uh, on this note, actually, for the, this uh, gender, water, and climate program, uh, let me share that there is a lot of work that's being done in Tunisia, in Benin, Cameroon, Uganda, Zambia. So for the time being, there is a focus on that. However, it, it is also continental, and there is going to be a focus on additional five countries, including, of course, countries of sub-Saharan Africa. So I, I very much urge you, uh, you know, to, to, to check what is happening over there and uh, the work that is being done. When it comes to the MENA region, and maybe to close uh, with, with that, um, what, we have, um, what we have found through the different lines of works, including the, this initiative on female leadership and uh, water diplomacy, is that uh, in, in many countries, if not in most countries, the framework is already in place. The legislative, institutional place, you know, framework, having quotas as well, uh, regarding the representation and participation of women in the different bodies, whether in public life or in, in parliaments. Um, however, uh, still we see limited participation and involvement of women in positions and particularly in, the, in leadership positions. So in, in the work that we did with the comparative study, which is of course by no means exhaustive, and it's, no, it's not statistical either, was to identify why is this happening? And, um, and, uh, and the sample that we got actually was from women that, uh, first of all, they, they had a lot of experience. We're talking about 10, 15, 20 years in the water sector. And we're talking about women that are very much uh, you know, qualified, uh, holders of master's degrees, of PhD degrees, of further qualifications. Uh, so these women, still, they do not claim leadership positions without, within their establishments. And this is why it, it, was, it became so interesting for us to understand what is happening. And uh, th there is a, a barrier that uh, very often, particularly in the MENA region, we women put in front of us by themselves, by ourselves, uh, by thinking that we're not qualified enough, we're not experienced enough, we're not good enough, uh, you know, the, the circumstances are not uh, favorable for us. Uh, we should not really be uh, fighting or, you know, um, breaking the different stereotypes because uh, in certain positions, in, in certain uh, parts of uh, jobs, we are not really supposed to be there. So to a very large extent, and I want to say this very loudly, it is us putting the barriers to ourselves and our own perceptions, our negative perceptions of what we can do. So it is really time to stop this and claim what we can very easily attain because of the experience and qualifications that are more often are higher than those of male counterparts, with all due respect, of course, to our, to our counterparts. 
uh, and colleagues. Uh, so it's it's really up to us to be able to make this transition and uh, and break the you know the stereotypes and what is is holding us back. Um, being well informed and uh, and really uh, presenting our position with arguments based on technical knowledge is something that cannot be contested by anybody. And it's it's a very solid and good way to to, to be able to claim uh, our own position because <laughs> well informed and uh, solid arguments uh, can can definitely um, you know uh, I would say uh, convince even those that do not believe in gender equality. And uh, the last thing I would like to say is that when talking about gender, uh, we should not uh, misunderstand that this is only a women's affair. And because you know we keep saying about women and claiming positions and breaking the barriers, but no, 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 no. Gender is not about women. It's about men and women, as we know very well. So uh, the involvement, active involvement uh, of both men and women in breaking these barriers and creating the circumstances for something that is truly gender equal uh, comes, you know, at the is the responsibility for all of us. So not only women, but also men alike. Um, let me let me stop here. Thank you so much for for this opportunity. I will share also a couple of links on the chat. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kanti. I appreciate so much uh, uh, if you could share uh, this important uh, links. And uh, uh, Dr. Carlin, please you can add also. Thank you, um, Dr. Wawa. And I couldn't agree more with Dr. Anti and Dr. Nages in the in the statement that uh, it is a shared issue that we need to work together on to, to, to find solutions to. Um, I'd also like to talk about capacity to, um, development and education just a little bit and what that means. Um, because uh, when we talk about capacity development and education in certain areas that are going to improve women's participation, it's often referred to as, you know, upskilling them from a technical a technical capacity or upskilling them from a science capacity to enable them to do the job better. When in actual fact, Dr. Anthe is quite correct. There are many, many, many highly qualified women who put barriers in front of themselves. I work a lot in women's mentoring and women's executive development and also in leadership. The capacity development needs to be invested in actually creating the power to influence within women so that women can not only influence others and influence their ability to take on bigger and better roles, they can actually influence women to understand that they have the capacity to do this. They have the skills, they have the technical capability to do it. They just need to be able to learn how to step forward. And that's a really critical thing because in the leadership development that I do in executive women's coaching, is that women will look at a job application and they'll see it requires 10 things, 10 capabilities. And they will go, I've only got eight and won't apply. Whereas a man will see the same advertisement and say, I've got two of those, I'm highly qualified, I'll learn the rest on the job. And women need to be encouraged and they need to be educated in a way that enables them to use their power of influence in that space to step up and go, I can do this. And so when we talk about capacity development, it's not just about the technical or the scientific, but it's the capability to be able to step forward and trust in yourself. And also then the capability to learn the power of influence in the environment that you're working in. And that is something critical that women do really, really well in a whole range of different um, components of their life, but not necessarily in the workplace. And we need to work on that also. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Colin. And uh, due to the limitation of time, we will not be able to answer all the questions. But uh, I, I would like to invite uh, the distinguished speaker uh, just to, in, in one minute, to give uh, a concrete uh, recommendation. Just in one minute, please. Dr. Colin. I would certainly like to support the recommendation I think has already been suggested that um, I should consider a task force in this regard, but make sure that the task force is not all women, <laughs> that the task force is actually made up of key influences in the world of men's irrigation commission on irrigation and drainage. And I observe that sitting in the room back there in Delhi, um, there's not a very good gender balance there. So I think that there is a, an observation that I will make <laughs> <laughs> for my very learned colleagues and my good friends back at ISID head office. 
that I think that we can all work together. And if we're going to have an effective task team that's going to make a difference, we need to have powerful and influential men as part of that task force. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Antti? Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Yes, um, well, uh, definitely, definitely support, uh, you know, what uh, Dr. Kaleen said about bringing in men as well as women. And when it comes to women, uh, just to encourage not to um, get into the quotas, uh, you know, necess necessity, but make sure that the women that participate are actually the ones that are qualified and knowledgeable and the right people to be in the task force. Um, second point is to also look out uh, for what other uh, initiatives, networks, uh, programs, work line is already ongoing or is, uh, you know, is, has, been, has been taking place for some time on the issue so that there is no duplication, replication and so on. So make sure that there are complementarities of work. And uh, I would very much encourage to build on the, on the strength of ICID, which comes, you know, with irrigation and drainage. This is something that is not, um, at least in my modest experiences, covered extensively when it comes to gender and irrigation and drainage. So this could be actually a very interesting point of um, particularity and, and, and the niche uh, for this task force to work on. And of course, I remain at your disposal, very happy to work together and to, to be able to support you as much as possible. Thank you, Thank you much. so much. Uh, Dr. Nargis, in one minute, please. As I, uh, the slogan of the, uh, uh, the slogan of the water for 2023, we have a critical position about the water in the world. And active all capability would help to solve this critical position is important. It's not related to the men or women. Yes, to solve, to help, to be together, to help this, to solve this problem, we should active all capability. It's not related to the gender, I think. All of the people should help, but we know in some country and some region in the world, this matter not uh, good. And I, uh, want national and international cooperation and agency and government more active to involve women as a one big capability. Thank you very much, Dr. Naris. Yes. yes. Uh, <laughs> I would like to invite uh, the distinguished. Excuse me, Dr. No, no, Excuse no. me, Dr. Yes. Bafa, Afghanistan is very important and Dr. Fayez takes me more and more he wants to speak. Please let him to I speak. I am very sorry because there is another meeting now uh, for the ICID. I, 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 I can invite him just for one minute, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Open. Dr. Fayez, would you please open your uh, show my... yourself? Can you raise your hand? Can you please raise your hand so that raise we can... your hand, Dr. Fires? Are you here? Excuse me so much because he's calling me. To okay. Uh, in, in such a case, uh, is it possible so... that I yes. send his yes, message? Dr. Baba, let us uh, yes. give uh, uh, this speaking rights to Dr. Fires from Afghanistan. Let him speak for a few minutes, three, four minutes. That's not a problem. We can address okay. that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Dr. Faiz is here, please. Dr. Faiz. Can you, can you please raise your hand, please? Dr. Faiz. Uh, is it possible that I send him his message? Yeah, he, he, he. Yes, please. You can. You can. Okay. Send, Dr. Uh, Fayez uh, asked for a separate session for Afghanistan committee for these uh, uh, this cooperation. Okay, this team, Carlin, Auntie, Dr. Wahba, Dr. Rajab Central Office. Okay, and uh, 
uh, she uh, she he couldn't come here now and uh, they have more uh, more uh, subject more more uh, important subject about the gender in his country and i know they are very on pressure very 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 and I hope central office coordinate this meeting. It's Dr. Rajab, Carlin, Auntie, Dr. Baba and me to help them because uh, he, he, he has different problem and I think this meeting is finished. And he has separate meeting. I could uh, coordinate this and uh, adjust it with all of you like this seminar. If you agree, yes. Yeah. Dr. Anti, I agree. We have se we have separate session for Afghanistan. We can definitely explore options, yes, and see what is feasible. Of course. Thank you so much, Dr. Carly. We are yes, we are fully agree. We will give the full support to Afghanistan National Committee and also for Afghanistan young professional. We already yes, take uh, we took the action. We established the group for Afghanistan young professional, and we'll keep them in touch with us. And uh, we will discuss with our partner how we could support them. We recognize uh, clearly uh, there is a, a big gap for Afghanistan situation, and we'll do our best to support them. Okay. Uh, uh, I would like to invite uh, our distinguished participant to open camera for group photo, please. Can you open your camera, please? So, uh, Dr. Wawa, participants will not be able to open the, their camera because uh, only, panelists. Only, only panelists can uh, open mm. the camera. Okay, so you can take it. You can take it to one photo group photo for the panelists. Okay. Again, uh, 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 after this group photo, Doctor Nairizi, Doctor Sylvester. No, they can't. They, 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 they can't. Are, uh, okay, please. Okay. So we have taken the photo. Okay. okay. And you can request uh, Doctor uh, our president, Professor Doctor Raghav, to say. Yes, uh, please, Doctor Raghav. Dr. Raghav, you are invited to give your closing remark. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Wahba, and I thank the speakers again for uh, such a fruitful and uh, exciting day. Uh, we have actually uh, 180 participants today. Uh, the majority I noticed from the names are ladies, and I'm pleased also to see men came to that meeting, and that's what we need. We need man really to be also listening and also to take uh, part in the women empowerment. Uh, there are some uh, uh, take home really points from the speakers. Let me uh, uh, summarize them. Uh, the, uh, the Honorable Lady uh, Colin mentioned that we should bring together men and women to the table to discuss and to reach uh, a mutual uh, uh, decisions. Uh, we need to create conditions for women to participate and we need to change the culture so that women can take part in taking decisions and also women need to be involved in politics and the presence of women can lead to different decisions uh, women know what the problem is and also they know what the solution is and voice of women must be heard education program leadership program Cultural changes to enable women are all needed. We need to embrace cultural changes, break barriers, and we need support of men as part of the partnership. So that's main points from what I understood from uh, the Honorable Lady Colin. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ansia, Ansia uh, Broma, uh, also she said the, the, the Global Water Partnership produce so many documents and uh, uh, on women uh, empowerment, capacity building, and integrated water resources management, the gender uh, issue in connection with water resources management, the community setup, and empowering women in water diplomacy. And she mentioned the six ladies uh, initiative of the MENA regions, 
uh, where the empower, uh, empowering women in water diplomacy and the transboundary cooperation in MENA region was really uh, a good example of cooperation. And also she referred to the male-female ratio in MENA uh, region and, and how we need to, uh, to deal with the cultural barriers and the skills needed for a better leadership in water diplomacy, and also what makes women a good water diplomat uh, uh, in water management. Uh, Dr. Nargis also mentioned the role of women in water. Why women uh, uh, participation in water uh, management is important. And she also mentioned that participation of women at different levels and the gender gap in different countries and the current status of women participation in water management, even in Europe, she also noticed that it needs to be improved, uh, that, that ratio. Uh, ways also to improve education, capacity building, international projects like the IMI related projects, Afghanistan, and also the Nile project. And also she invited at the end, the uh, international organization to be more active in the area of empowering women in water management. And she mentioned and uh, also in her comments, there's no gender issue. What we need is actually changes to allow women to take decision and to be a part of the decision. I hope I summarized really uh, your input together. Um, I'm quite happy with the day and how it, how it went. And thank you once again for your input to this meeting. And definitely an ICID will set up a, spe a special task force to, to take that subject on. And hopefully it will uh, lead to uh, a new working group that will deal with the empowering women in water resources management. Thank you very much for your contribution today. And thank uh, I thank the central office for looking after this meeting and the coordinator, Dr. Waba, for also coordinating that meeting successfully. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Dr. Ragab. And no doubt that empowering women in water management will provide a necessary basis for effective water management and achieving sustainable development goals. It will provide equal job opportunity for women to participate in the, in the policy and decision made regarding water management. And by utilizing the innate nature of women for management, it is possible to develop flexible water management systems, thus developing higher efficiency and ultimately changing social uh, influence and health. Uh, at the end, I would like to thank uh, the honorable speaker, Dr. Collin, Dr. Anti, Dr. Nagers for their valuable presentation. Uh, a special thank to all of you for your times and fruitful contribution in the discussion and participation. I wish you uh, all the best and I look forward to see you all in uh, uh, in near future, uh, physically and in, in our uh, future webinars. By this, we came to the end to the webinar and uh, thank you very much again for you all. Yeah, thank you, thank Dr. You. Thank you, Dr. Uh, for, from ICD Central Office, I thank our president, Professor Dr. Raga Raga, to join this webinar and uh, share his views uh, as a part of opening remarks and then uh, subsequently summarizing uh, the discussions and the presentations which took place to contribute. Discussions and presentations which took place uh, during uh, uh, this uh, webinar. I thank all the speakers, Honorable uh, Carlin Mewar, uh, N.T. Bruno, and Dr. Nargis Zaravi for making a very good presentation and which uh, induced a lot of questions. And we are sorry for the attendees that we could not take all the questions and then there, there were a lot of raised hands, but we could not give time to uh, all of them because of possible time, because this webinar is on, already more than two hours. And then we have another meeting which is planned after some time. So we have to prepare for that. And then uh, I thank Dr. Wawa for moderating this session in a very nice manner. And for the information of the participants, we'll put the recording of this webinar in a day or two after its processing on our website. Then uh, this can be viewed and uh, everybody can see it on the 
and then uh, on our website. If the speakers agree, then uh, we can share their presentation PDF form also uh, on our website. So that the speakers have to confirm and share the presentation, then we'll put those presentation also on the website. So in the end, I thank all the attendees who have attended. It was a very large number, almost uh, 180 participants, which is a very large number as compared to our other uh, webinars. This shows that uh, there, is, there, was, there is a lot of interest in this subject of gender equality, and then how women can participate and contribute in the water management sector, seeing the issues of climate change, water scarcity, and other related issues. In the end, I thank one and all for this uh, very lively webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.